All right. Well, for the sake of time, why don't we get started? And then um, hopefully we'll still have a few others joining us. Um, but again, welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Courtney Collins. I am the Regional Director of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for the Illinois and Missouri chapters. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with you and to have so many of you joining us for our research connection. Um, you know, as you know, our mission at uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. And one way we do that is through research. Um, so we know that through research, we can learn a lot about suicide and how to prevent suicides. So we know it's a really important part of our work and really how we started as an organization. So today's research connection will uh, highlight one of our AFSP funded researchers, Dr. Shear, who will introduce and who will be speaking in a moment. Um, but thank you again for being here for this important conversation and to learn more about Dr. Shear's research and her work. And I will pass it over to Meg to introduce herself and also do a quick introduction of Dr. Shear. Hi, my name is Meg Graff. I serve on the board of directors for the Illinois chapter, and I have the honor of hosting this event every year. It's truly one of the, my favorite events that AFSP does. I always leave feeling very hopeful about the direction we're headed. Um, when I was going through our different grant recipients, I knew as soon as I saw Dr. Shear's um, work that we had to have here for the Research Connection Program. We all know that grief is complicated and there's even more feelings to process when there's a suicide involved. So I was very excited to take on this new perspective to our Research Connection Program. We are asking that anyone who has questions for Dr. Shear use the Q&A box. We will be then going through the questions at the end. If you have general AFSP questions, you can use the chat for that. And, uh, Courtney and I will be there. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Shear. Thanks so much, Courtney and Meg. And thanks to everyone who's here. Thanks for inviting me to come and talk with you today. So I'm going to be talking about complicated grief, even though the title of this talk is Prolonged Grief Disorder and its Treatment in Suicide Bereavement. And the reason for that is that we now have finally, after many years, a, an official DSM diagnosis as well as an, um, a diagnosis for the, from the World Health Organization. And they both have have decided to call this condition prolonged grief disorder. It is exactly the same as complicated grief, which is what we've been, the term we've been using um, for a long time. I do think that prolonged grief disorder has some advantages over complicated grief for reasons we can talk about maybe in the Q&A. But I am really very happy to be here and to tell you about the work that we've done in um, basically in treating the condition of prolonged grief disorder. I'm sure this is this is a slide I'm sure you've all seen or know only too well. Um, and I, it, it hasn't been updated in this form, but actually there are updated numbers now beyond 2016. And sadly, the trend actually is continuing, slightly elevated, but still continued. We, we still see increase in in suicide rate. So far, we haven't been able to make a huge, really much of a dent in this. And I, I included this slide that relates more to COVID-19 because this is the first really well, um, really carefully and um, accurately done demographic study of how many bereaved people there are after each death. And this, this was COVID-19 deaths, but it was, the, these are, Ashton Verdere and his colleagues are demographers, they're sociologists, and they, they had already been collecting data on kinship patterns in the United States. And so they were able to use their existing data sets to come up with a pretty good estimate of how many people were bereaved by each COVID death. And I think we can make the assumption that this is also true of each suicide death. And that turns out to be almost 10 times, nine times the number of people, nine people for each death. And that is higher than we've been estimating. So what I'm going to do in the next hour, hopefully, is to talk a little bit about how 
we understand grief in our work and um, and especially prolonged grief disorder and then how we treat it. What What is prolonged grief disorder therapy? And I'm going to really walk you through that and show you the results of our studies and in particular our studies for suicide bereavement for people who have prolonged grief disorder with after suicide bereavement. So the definition of grief actually is pretty simple. It's the response to loss. I think there's pretty good agreement about that. However, there's not really any agreement on how how we understand grief really how we people define it some people say it's an emotion some people say it, it's more than emotion we say it's more than an emotion but um, if you google and I did this a couple of weeks ago if you google what is grief you get all of these really pretty pretty different answers to that question so you probably all have your own definition we all have our own definition of grief whether we have experienced it or not, but certainly if we have. And so if you want, you can kind of share in the chat just with each other how you you define grief and how you think about grief as I'm telling you how I define it and think about it. So the first thing I want to say about it is that at the Center for Complicated Grief or the Center, which will be the Center for Prolonged Grief shortly, um, we believe that grief is the form that love takes when someone we love dies. I'm going to say more about that as we continue, but I think it's it's a really, really important point because it's, a, it's an important idea that we want to, I, I hope that I can convince you of because I think it really is important in in experiencing grief that we that we understand and acknowledge this aspect of it. It's not all that grief is, but it is this. And it is permanent after someone dies. It's universal when we don't have loss without grief. We don't have a meaningful loss without grief, and we don't have grief without a meaningful loss. They're sort of inextricably tied together. And grief is, we talk about it because when we, you know, we talk about it, we can recognize it and treat it because there are common features of grief, which we're going to be talking about. But we also know that grief is unique to every single person and actually not only even every person, but every loss that each of us has. So no two loss experiences we are, are exactly the same in terms of how we grieve them. And partly as a result of that, it's pretty messy. It's, so we think grief has a lot of kind of varying thoughts and feelings and behaviors and also social and spiritual aspects to it. It isn't one thing either, even within one of us and even within one loss, it's not one thing because it changes. And in the beginning, it can change erratically and in, unpredictably what, it, what you're experiencing as grief. And usually it evolves over time, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But part of why it's erratic and unpredictable is because it's not only something internal to us, but it's affected by other people and by things that are happening in our lives, and some of which are unexpected and uncontrollable. So that's all important, but it's also important that grief doesn't have stages. I think people experiencing grief and people trying to help with grief are, are sort of overwhelmed by its its complexity and its power. And they really seek to try to figure out how you're supposed to do it right. People often ask themselves, are they grieving right? Or they ask other people, they come to us as professionals and say they want to check in because they want to make sure they're grieving right. Of course, there's no right or wrong way to grieve at all. But grief, and it doesn't have stages, but it does progress. And it does have some common, meaning some typical types of what we call pause points that we'll be talking about in a minute. So if we want to understand grief, we're not going to understand it by stages or by you know predictable things about it. But attachment theory can help us understand it. Because if we want to understand what it's like to lose someone or to lose something or someone close, um, then we want to know what it is to have that someone. And attachment theory 
is a, a psychological theory. Those of you who are either interested in this or, or professionals probably know about attachment theory, but it, it is a very well um, supported, empirically research supported theory of, of close relationships. And it, it has as its kind of center is that we have a biological motivation. It's really in our biology. That's what this slide is intended to illustrate, really to seek, form, and maintain close relationships with a few important people in our life. And what goes along with that, I think by definition, is that we also are, are kind of biologically prepared, so to speak. It's in our biology also to adapt to their loss. So what these relationships are, what, what characterizes them is that they are intrinsically rewarding, meaning these are people that we would that we want to be with, that we like to be with. We'd rather be with them than be separated from them. We often react to their, we react to meaningful separations from people that we're attached to. And that's partly because they're rewarding to be with. We like to be with them. It's pleasurable to be with them, but also because they are people who provide what we call safe haven and secure base functions. And what that means is they're the people who are there for us, who who will help us, support us, comfort us when things are not going so well. And they are also there for us to support us and to have confidence in us and to share our successes when we're going out in the world and things are going well. So they play a very important role in our lives. In addition to these roles, they also have, a, it turns out they have a lot of functions um, that are out of our awareness. So they, they help regulate our bodies and our minds. I'm not going to talk much about that right now, but I think it's quite important when we think about losing these people. So what does happen when a loved one dies? Well, that registers in our brains as a meaningful separation <clears throat> from someone we're attached to. And that leads to what's called proximity seeking, really just trying to searching and looking and wanting to find them. Even if you know that they've died, for example, it's still something that most of us do. We, well, we, all, we do it automatically. Everyone does it really automatically. And we feel anxious and we and our bodies and minds are dysregulated. And we also have we also, the people we love, not only do they provide us with a safe haven and a secure base, but we provide that for them as well. And, and of course, with children, that's the caregiving side of it is the most important, but the care, caregiving is right along with attachment in as part of our biology. And so is the urge to go out and explore the world and learn new things and perform and such. And so a meaningful separation has all of these effects on the attachment system, caregiving and exploration. And when you look at what grief looks like, yearning, longing, and preoccupation with the person who died is right at the heart of grief. Of course, there's sadness. There's a lot of mixed emotions, all kinds of mixed emotions, and sadness is very strong. But yearning and longing is really what's at the heart of grief. And then there is, there are all these other um, kind of experiences, symptoms, if you will, on the that are listed on the right, and they map really directly onto what happens to the attachment system. And so that's one of the reasons why we say that grief is the form, literally the form, love takes when someone we love dies. But the other thing that is of course true is that. The, the death of a loved one is a major life stressor, regardless of how they die. Of course, when they die by suicide, that's even more, much more intense how stressful it is. But any anytime we lose someone close, and again, it doesn't matter who they are either. It's if, if we're close to them, it's going to be a major life stressor and one of the greatest challenges we ever face. And that's because the loss itself is, of course, very stressful. But also the experience of grief, as I've kind of been alluding to, is stressful as well. And then there are all kinds of effects that the loss has on our families, on other social relationships that we have, on our feelings of inclusions in our social groups, in their changes in responsibilities that we have. There are 
changes in how we feel about ourselves and and our place in the world and all of that is highly highly stressful so just a word about this idea that grief itself contributes to the stress it's because it typically not only has a lot of different kinds of thoughts and feelings and and behaviors and social and spiritual aspects but also because there very often are confusing thoughts and mixed feelings and these occur very naturally but they can be they can be disconcerting because we don't usually have such mixed feelings about things and and this is where we come back to the idea of grief being a form of love because that's why we want to hold on to it we know that we we sort of just feel it and know it and so we want to hold on to the grief but of course it's very painful and stressful and we also want it to go away and the same thing with the pain and going on in our life and and needing other people interestingly we feel that need for other people but it's very hard to connect even even when there's not the added difficulty that occurs around the social discomfort of suicide very frequently or the stigma related to suicide so we there's all of that and then there's the confusing part of cognitive confusion about knowing we know the person is gone but you know it's really hard to understand that in the beginning so we know it's real but we we can't understand it and we we want to be connected to the person that we that we lost but we also want feel a need to avoid reminders and so all of this is painful and and confusing so what we're saying here is what i'm saying is that grief is a stress response and also a form of love and this is one way i this is another reason why i like to say that grief is a form of love because i learned it from c.s lewis and this quote i think is is really very beautiful he's talking about of course the death of his wife um, to, from cancer but still i think it's it's just a profound statement and so we need to give grief a place in our heart it's really one of the ways that we honor our love so we also have to cope with the stress of loss and in the grief world we talk about loss focused coping and restoration focused coping and we essentially bring all of our coping skills to this process because of course again we need that and one of the ways that we cope is is again sort of instinctive it's kind of in our biology to cope just like it is to adapt we're going to make that distinction between coping and adapting in a minute but but john bowlby who's the the sort of founder of of um attachment theory it points out that when a situation occurs which we evaluate as damaging to our interest or to those of persons we care for our first impulse is to try to rectify that situation and we call these writing reflexes and this is something that we know people do and there's been a lot of psychological research in this area and it doesn't only pertain to really intense stressors like suicide loss or any loss it also pertains to other things that go wrong in our lives or, or go wrong in the life of someone that we care about and we we just have this natural inclination to try to say among other things to try to dispute that it actually happened or see if we can think of a way that we could undo it those kinds of thoughts are just automatic for us so the and, and maybe they give us some some early relief from the intense pain of 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 a sudden loss or, or even of a loss period and and that's not so so there's nothing wrong there's nothing sort of intrinsically wrong with these these kinds of of writing reflexes this disbelief or protest we all have it it's just it's going to happen imagining alternative scenarios that's sometimes called counterfactual thinking so where we we think about all the ways this could have happened differently didn't have to happen in this way blame ourselves get angry with other people based on our wanting to take care of the person judging our grief you know not feeling comfortable with the grief avoiding grief triggers we all do that in the beginning um, experience survivor guilt again something virtually everyone does even people who aren't very close to the person who died and then this kind of feeling like we don't have the ability or the willingness to move forward in our lives and in this funny sense of disconnection from other people 
So then another quote from John Bowlby, he talks about these kinds of, he calls these defensive processes, which I think is another good word for them. They're writing reflexes, they're defensive, they're trying to protect ourselves, and they can be very helpful initially. But as he says, the length of time during which they persist and the extent to which they influence a part of our mental functioning or come to dominate it, that's what makes the difference between, he doesn't call it prolonged grief disorder, but that's what he is talking about. So this is what's the difference between grief that's progressing, grief that's going to end up integrated into our lives and grief that's going to stay um, basically dominating us completely and keeping us from moving forward. So there's one more thing that's important here, which is that the changes that occur in the world, again, whenever we lose someone close, are, are changes that we need to adapt to. We need to create, I guess, a new normal. I'm not crazy about that term because it, when I hear it, I always think of some kind of resignation. But the new normal, maybe everyone doesn't think of it that way. Certainly, we don't have to resign ourselves. We can create and adapt to a new world, even an unwanted world. And we have a kind of psychological immune system that operates a little bit like our physical immune system to help protect us when our psychological well-being is threatened. And it happens naturally, even some of it out of our awareness, if we don't get in our own way, which happens when we don't, um, you know, when, when those, those writing reflexes get too much airtime, so to speak. So I want to say one more word about the difference between coping and adapting, because both are important, of course, after we lose someone close. But I, I think if you just look at the two images, you see the basic difference. So coping we do because something's kind of in our face or we can see it really clearly. And and so we and we have to protect ourselves. So it uses existing resources and it tends to be oriented towards relief of a problem or pain. And it's something that we do and then we stop doing. We don't continue doing it. Adapting is very different because it entails long-term permanent really changes in our automatic expect expectations and some of our automatic behaviors. And it is much more oriented towards restoring our well-being and and building new sustainable resources. And that's what the image on the right shows. So what does adapting after loss look like? And basically, again, this comes from Bowlby again, and I think it's also from our, our work and our observations that we, we need to learn to accept the reality. And that means accepting the finality of the loss and the permanence of grief that goes along with it, the changes, that accompany loss, including, of course, very importantly, a changed relationship to the person who died. So we don't lose our relationship, but of course, it's quite dramatically changed when they're gone. And then the other piece is to restore our well being or our capacity, at least, for well being. And we think of this using a theory called self determination theory, which is was put forward in the year 2000 by. Uh, Richard Ryan and Edward Dietschy, two social psychologists, and they had already done a lot of research. And since then, there's even more research that's been done cross-culturally, across age groups in different situations. But that we, it seems as though to, to have a, to be able to flourish in life, to be able to have really well-being, we need to have a sense of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And these restoring purpose and meaning having a feeling of competence and confidence in ourselves and the promise of satisfying meaningful relationships that make us feel like we belong and matter. That's what it means to restore our well-being. Another, another way we can think about restoring well-being after a loss is by paying attention to this series of healing milestones. And this comes really directly from the work that we've done to help people with prolonged grief. But we found that if we, if we can work on and make progress in each of these milestone areas, that people 
come out in a very different place in a very short time, which I'm going to show you the results of that in a minute. But the first thing we need to do is help people understand and accept grief, then to manage along with that really to manage emotions, especially painful emotions, but also positive ones, to be able to see a promising future of some sort, or at least the promise of a, fu of a, of a future that has promise, um, to be able to strengthen feelings of relatedness, to be able to tell ourselves the story of the death in a way that allows us to think about it um, without being really overwhelmed emotionally. Of course, it's always going to be a difficult story, but being able to tell it to ourselves and being able to tell it to others is something that is, is really very helpful in adapting to a loss. Also to learn to live with reminders, which can be very, very prevalent. And then to be able to connect with those reminders, to connect with the memories of the person who died in a meaningful way. That will often help us grow and learn and also provide us with comfort and some sense of safety as we move forward in our lives without the person we love in them. So to kind of summarize, we almost always react very strongly when we lose someone close and especially, of course, after a suicide loss. And so we call this acute grief, which is characterized by these very powerful emotions, insistent kinds of thoughts and behaviors and physical feelings, physical symptoms, and, and really very different feelings about ourselves as well. But even though we do react very strongly, we still, all, most of us do still adapt to this reality. And as we do that, and remember adapting means, what I mean by adapting when I say that word is accepting the reality in the ways that we just talked about and restoring the capacity for well-being in, in those ways of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And as we do that, grief is transformed and finds a place in our life. We say grief emerges naturally and finds a place in our life. And as it does that, it sort of quiets and softens in the ways that are described on, on this slide. But I always like to point out that even when that happens, that doesn't mean that it stays that way all the time. It's just, it, it stops dominating our lives in a way that interferes with our ability to, again, to, to move forward in our own life in a meaningful way. And we know that our loved ones would want us to do that, of course, but it's hard to do. It's especially hard to do when grief is very activated, but most of the time integrated grief is not activated, but it does sometimes become activated. And what you see on this slide is a, an image of a handout that we have on our website, if you're interested, um, which is kind of just some suggested ways to manage those calendar days in life events or any time really when grief is is just suddenly activated, temporarily activated, and um, and you know we do have to manage it in some way at that point. So I like to think in images. This is this is a, just what I just said um, in a sort of graphic form. It helps me think through what I want to do in terms of helping people. And sometimes this is what prolonged grief disorder is. This is now an official diagnosis in DSM-5, but it hasn't been fully announced by the American Psychiatric Association. So um, you can use that information in whatever way you want, but it is, you can find it on the internet, um, but not officially. And it, this is what happens when that process of adapting is derailed is how we think of it, or when the pause points become stuck points is another way to, to think about it. When they start to influence, as Bowlby said, our mental functioning dominate to, in a dominating way as, as opposed to just part of the functioning and when, when they persist. So the DSM criteria say that the person died at least 12 months ago. The international criteria, the ICD-11 criteria say at least six months. So there's still some uncertainty about what that should be. And at the center is this idea of persistent, pervasive yearning, longing, or preoccupation with the person who died. And then in addition, 
at least three of these other um, symptoms are present for at least the every day for at least the last month. But really, these you'll find these and other um, other kinds of grief-related symptoms to be very very prevalent when the persistent pervasive yearning, longing, and preoccupation with the person is present to an extent which which interferes with the person's life. And that, that's really what you see criterion D. And, and with regard to the time frame, both criteria sets specifically say that the duration and severity needs to clearly exceed what's expected in the social environment from cultural or religious norms or the whatever the context is, family expectations. So that's a that's another kind of hedge on that time frame. So this is this is that image that I showed you a minute ago, that that sort of model that we use for the therapy. And you can see where the the, um, the pause points have become stuck points and we don't get the process we don't get the progress in adapting to the loss and grief is not integrated. Instead, it stays acute. And along with the stuck points, it really is center stage in a person's life. So obviously, I think it's obvious that what we're going to do is we're going to target our treatment is going to target the stuck points, of course, but also try to reactivate or facilitate the natural adaptive process. That's really what we're going to do in this therapy. I want to say just a couple of words about the kinds of challenges that increase the risk that PGD is going to develop. And certainly one of the things that I don't have on the slides, but I think we all know, is that the situation of losing someone during the, the COVID epidemic, whether it's to COVID itself or in any other way, including suicide, the um, th there are increased risk factors related to the circumstances, well, really to the aftermath of the death, regardless of how the death happens and, and when it's a COVID death to the COVID death as well. But these are the kinds of, of challenges that are person related, the relationship with the person, the closer we are to them, the more, the more important they are in our life, really. And especially if, if they're very special in terms of their um, being that person that we really turn to, the, the main person or even the only person that we turn to for as a safe haven or secure base, or if we're their primary caregiver, same thing. Those are, those are the relationship factors that generally play a role here. And then here are some of the circumstances related to the death and certainly suicide bereavement is high among them as increasing the risk of prolonged grief disorder. And, and here are some other reasons why suicide bereavement is especially challenging. I think again, these are probably familiar to everyone, but they do increase the chances that these kinds of, of thoughts and experiences are going to be very center stage that you, you can see how this is going to, to kind of be more difficult to, to sort of deal with these pause points. These are pause points for anyone. Most of these occur with some frequency in almost any kind of loss, but in suicide loss, they're very, almost everyone has at least one or two of these and then in a very sticky sort of way. And that is going to slow down or stall or halt the process of adapting to the loss. So now I'm going to tell you for the rest of the time I'm talking about the therapy that we developed and tested. I'm going to tell you about the therapy itself and then um, how we, some of the, the results, I'm going to show you some of the results of our testing. And then I'm going to walk you through, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the, the sort of concept of what we're doing. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we do it, but mostly I'm going to try to show it to you in a way that's more accessible for your daily life. If, if you're a therapist or if you're a, a sufferer or a, a helper, whatever, I think it'll make more sense to you. So this is a 16 session therapy, which is pretty strongly evidence-based and 
um, meaning it's been it's been tested in a number of of very rigorous um, randomized controlled trials, some some of which have been funded by the AFSP, and its goals are, like I said, to facilitate adapting to the loss and identify and address these stuck points or derailers, if you will, and also to provide an effective relationship, supportive relationship. That's always important in psychotherapy, but it's especially important in, and it's a special kind of relationship when we're doing grief therapy. So we do know that grief can be a dark and lonely place, but we do not do anything directly to lower its intensity. We don't necessarily look to lower its intensity. We, we do, we do, we, we do expect it to, to soften and quiet, as I said, most of the time when um, we are successful in helping people adapt to the loss. But we don't, grief is not the target of this intervention. Instead, we're going to focus on what I like to think of as turning on, the, turning on a light, warming things up, and opening a door to the outside world. So that's, again, this is really what we're going to be trying to do with people. We're going to foster these healing milestones. That's really at the center of the treatment. And as we're doing that, to find and address the stuck points. So this is the result of our three NIMH funded studies. And as you can see, this is just the overall results. And um, over here is, the, is a total of 641 study participants have been included in these results. And what you see is we, had, we saw a 71% overall response rate to pro prolonged grief disorder therapy. PGDT, which we also call CGT. And that compared to interpersonal psychotherapy or antidepressant medication, which has a 44% response rate to those um, are not what we expect generally. We certainly not what we expect to, for depression. So this is a very striking difference in these outcomes. And we've looked across all different kinds of variables to see if there's any difference in outcome, depending on who died, how they died, what, you know, what characteristics like this one is um, that, that we found no difference by race. So we had sadly only 55 people who self-identified as blacks, as black in our studies, in all of our studies, but those 55 people did not show any hint of less efficacy than the white participants. So I want to show you a little bit about the role of medication. This, this graph on the left shows you what I just showed you in a different way. This, this is basically, these are the drug and placebo or antidepressant medication. That was citalopram in this case, <clears throat> or placebo. And you can see no difference at all in grief, in prolonged grief disorder symptoms, but a significant difference between those who did and did not get prolonged grief disorder therapy and no difference in whether the antidepressant or placebo was added to the prolonged grief disorder therapy. However, on the bottom graph, you see the results for depression symptoms. And here we do see a difference. There isn't a difference between citalopram and placebo without PGDT, but with the therapy, we're seeing, as you see here, a significant and, and clinically and statistically significant greater improvement in depressive symptoms. So for people who have both, and, uh, both depression and prolonged grief symptoms, it does seem to be beneficial to add antidepressant medication. So what about suicide bereavement? And these are, this we, we, we studied suicide uh, bereaved people with prolonged grief disorder in our foresight when one of the, the largest actually of the three studies I just showed you. And, um, and we had, uh, I think again, about 56, I believe was the number of people. Yeah, this is 57 was the, the number. And what this slide shows you is that baseline comparisons, these are our, our basic, this is a grief measure, the inventory of complicated grief. This is the depression measure, the quick inventory of depressive symptoms, the 
typical beliefs questionnaire is the kinds of thinking that grief related thinking um, that can get in the way of adapting to loss. Work and social adjustment is functional impairment. And this is a general, general um, complicated grief severity. So even though we weren't seeing um, any difference in the standard self-report measure, our independent evaluators were judging the suicide bereaved as being higher. It, this is not a statistically significant difference here, but they are higher in severity. Suicidal thinking at baseline may have influenced that because it was higher, um, although not dramatically higher, it is higher um, after the death. So this is before and also definitely higher before the death. So we asked people if they were, if they'd had thoughts, this is the bereaved population, if they had been thinking about um, wanting to die or any kind of suicidal thinking before the death and half of them had been, but then 66% after the death. And you can see everyone is elevated after the death also. Okay, so, and then active suicidal ideation. Again, you're, you're gonna see that more pronounced. So the outcomes for suicide bereaved, what you see here is um, citalopram. So th this, is the, this, this is citalopram plus CGT versus Cital, um, placebo plus CGT. And in all cases, there's no difference, as you see. Slight difference from natural cause bereavement with, um, with the, but that is not a statistically significant difference. What you do notice is the pattern here is a little bit different. This is still, this is still um, significantly, the, the suicide bereaved are still significantly better with PGDT than with any other therapy, but it's not as strong a response on this measure. And again, this is a measure by the independent evaluators, similar to the, that severity measure, because the other outcomes, however, show no difference in, these are, these are the, um, I think the, yeah, they, they show basically no difference in outcomes from the natural death or homicide death. So clearly the people who we've treated and we, we have many anecdotes of this as well with suicide bereavement have, um, have benefited from this approach. And again, the suicidal thinking that I showed you before um, shows a marked reduction in um, post-treatment and active suicidal. This is both with, with CGT and there, there's really little difference with medication alone. So let's talk about what this treatment is. Again, the premise of it is that loss triggers acute grief and also a natural adaptive process by which grief is usually transformed and integrated. And so what we're trying to do here is to facilitate a natural adaptive process by both by both directly working with the healing milestones and also working to remove obstacles in the form of the stuck points. We do this treatment in 16 sessions guided by the milestones and each milestone being associated with a specific procedure. So we start this process um, with understanding and accepting grief and then move to managing emotions, seeing a promising future, strengthening social relationships, telling the story of the death, learning to live with reminders and connecting with memories. So I'm going to walk you through each of these. So we basically are going to talk about grief in the way that I've been talking about it with you this afternoon. And um, and, and basically the other thing we do is we monitor, we, we, we ask people to monitor their grief because there are a number of ways that we can use grief monitoring to help people understand and accept grief in these, you know, we, we, we do provide psychoeducation. That's one of the procedures. So we have two procedures for understanding and accepting grief and two procedures for managing emotions. So we, they're the same two for both of those. Um, 
And one of the things that monitoring does is uh, I'll show you in a minute, but grief naturally waxes and wanes. You may know this, but it, it's not always, it, it, for almost, it almost never stays at its highest point all day long. And, and before it's, it's pretty much along, before you're pretty much along the way of adapting to the loss, it doesn't stay its lowest most of the day either. So we, but that oscillation we believe is very helpful to the process of, of adapting because we need to both engage with the emotional pain and also be able to set it aside. So monitoring grief helps people start to see that they do that naturally and to build on that. This slide also includes some of the common stuck points that we see in this process of understanding and adapting and, and accepting grief. And this is how we do the grief monitoring. So we, we ask people to take just a couple of minutes, really five to 10 minutes at the end of each day and think back over the day to a time when their grief intensity was at its highest and try to rate that intensity on a one to 10 scale where, where 10 is the highest grief they've ever experienced and one is the lowest. And then, you know, and if there's more than one time point, they, they simply choose any one of the times. And, and so we would ask them to rate that highest grief point and then make a, a brief note about what was happening at the time. I sat down for dinner or I woke up in the morning or I came back home after I was out or whatever it might be. And then we ask them to do the exact same thing with the lowest level of grief for the day, rate that on a one to 10 scale and say what was happening at the time. And then just take a minute to think about the day overall and to call it, you know, maybe a, a high, medium or low grief day. And if it's, and then after you do that, so if it's a high day, you would, you would rate it somewhere between seven and 10. If it's a medium day between, between um, four and six and, and then below four, if it's a low day. And then you get a, so you get a record every day of the week. And we do this throughout the whole entire therapy. We work with managing emotional pain using that diary because we're going to review it with the person in the beginning of the session, each session that we see them. But we do this by using pretty much standard ways of helping people manage emotional pain, accepting emotions, naming them, not judging them. A lot of times when we feel some kind of a painful emotion, we get angry with ourselves or we feel ashamed of ourselves or we feel anxious about it. And that actually just more enhances it. So we try to help people see emotions for what they are and, and, and to think about whether what they can learn. Basically, often we can learn something from emotions. So we want them to kind of reflect on the emotion that they're experiencing. And also we encourage the experiencing and savoring of positive emotions. We're going to talk about this here, but also in, in a minute when we talk about um, seeing a promising future. This is going to be a part of it. But we really want people to be able to feel okay about feeling positive emotions. That can be hard during grief also. And again, common stuck points that occur with this, with this milestone. Then in terms of seeing a promising future, we take some time to try to work with people to help them consider what's really important and meaningful to them in their life. And that can be surprisingly difficult to access in the beginning when, when someone is really, really grieving intensely. It's, it's very hard to think about what they really care about and what's important to them, still important to them. But we, we are able to do that gradually over time. We introduce this very early in the therapy and we work with it throughout the whole time. And in addition to that, we encourage people to, to, to basically find, um, find some time to think about some kind of a daily life activity that you can turn into almost like a ritual, which has positive emotions because that helps you think clearly. It helps you problem solve when you have positive emotions. We work to strengthen relationships. Um, we think that social connections are really important in grief also, and they can be surprisingly difficult. But we, we want people to leave our treatment with at least one close confidant, and we work with them to try to help them do that. Um, and 
we do that by inviting someone in the therapy. We do it by inviting someone to come. We encourage the, the client actually to invite someone to come in um, for the third session. And, and we work with them to help them understand grief in the way that I've been talking about it this, this afternoon. And also um, the therapy, just an, a big broad picture, big picture of the therapy. So they know what their, their loved one or their, the person that they're supporting is experiencing going through and maybe they can help them in some ways. And it also is an opportunity for the for both people to remember how much they care about each other because that's almost always the case. And usually when someone has is struggling with prolonged grief, they've um, kind of worn out the people around them, not intentionally, of course, but it happens. And so the people around them have been trying and trying to help them kind of move forward in their own life and to adapt and deal with what they have to deal with. And it's just not working. And so the, the support people kind of give up on them and they can become very harsh or they can become, um, they, can, they can just withdraw altogether. So that's what we're trying to counteract here. And we're usually pretty successful with this too. And we do, we do carry this forward throughout the treatment also. And then only after this, after we've started the work with accepting grief and, and um, managing the emotions and starting to see some promise in the future, starting to feel like there's a possibility of reconnecting with people that the person cares about, then we turn to the really most emotionally activating part of this therapy, which is to talk about the death. And I would say that regardless of whether you're doing PGDT, which is a, a particular model and there's a treatment manual and you can come to our workshops and there is a, um, a self um, training, training program on our website and other ways to, to learn about this, regardless of whether you do that or you just want to use a model like this, don't be afraid to talk about the story of the death if you're talking with someone or to share it if you're the person sharing it because even though it's painful, for sure it's painful and maybe it's too difficult to even tell the whole story, but to do it and do it, it however you need to do it because making this story a thinkable story it is one of the things that's just enormously helpful. And we, we keep hearing this. I Actually, I talked yesterday with someone who's been doing, who did a, 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 he called me because he had done, this was a palliative care doctor and a pastor, and he had taken a group of people to, um, out of the country actually to do a psilocybin kind of um, experience. And he, I think the, this was a small group, but I think several of them were suicide bereaved parents. And, and one of the things that happened, they, and they, they had looked at our therapy, that's why he called me, but they said this was, when they saw this part, they said, no, they can't do this. And honestly, I agree with them. I wouldn't want to do this with someone under psilocybin, or I wouldn't have thought I would want to anyway. But he said that actually what happened naturally as a part of this process was that they all did actually share the story of the death and it was very very emotional and it was also very kind of helpful they thought that it was quite helpful to them so even under that kind of circumstance it seems like this is something that might be pretty important and quite counterintuitive as as important or for many people it is so then we go on to um, working, starting to work with the reminders. And this we do in, in ways that, um, that resembles the work that we behavior therapists do with phobias. So if you're familiar with that, it's, it's really an exposure kind of approach where we, a graded exposure kind of approach where we create a hierarchy of, of um, situations that the person is avoiding and then try to help them start to do these things in a way that's challenging but doable. And you can also do this though with, so the things that are different from phobias are that for one thing, phobias, people's friends and family are usually telling them, you know, okay, you're afraid of spiders. You need to go and find some spiders. You, you gotta quit, you know, organizing your whole life around not seeing any spiders or whatever it is. And 
but w with grief, most people will say, well, you know, if you if it upsets you to go to a certain supermarket or a restaurant or a park that you used to walk in with this person, then just find a different park or find a different restaurant or find a different supermarket. So friends and family are encouraging the avoidance, which which and and therapists sometimes do that too, which I guess, you know, it does have avoidance has a role in life and it certainly has a role in grief. But my own feeling is that if you stick to it, if you really, if you get committed to it, you're not doing yourself any favors because the other side, the, the other thing that's so different about grief avoidance is that the very things that we want to avoid that are triggering the most intense emotional pain, especially in the beginning, are things that contain very often very positive memories that we make us want to, you know, triggers grief, which means triggering yearning and longing for the person. But over time, we want to be able to accept the reality of the loss in a way that we're not, we're not yearning and longing in that same intensity way. And so we can connect with, start to connect with our memories, which, which is one of the most comforting things that we can actually do. So we can also work with this this theme, this healing milestone, by just talking with people about gradually returning to the world in whatever way makes sense to them in their own time, in their own way, but making a commitment that over time, this is what they're going to do. And then the, our last milestone is to connect with the memories of the person who died, because this is really our living connection to the person who died. I usually show a Frederick Buchner quote, um, uh, that, that is just very beautiful. I'm sorry, I forgot to put it in for this um, presentation. But it, the, the idea is that, that memories are not snapshots within us or, or photo albums or, or, or facts or anything like that. They're living, breathing parts of us. And so they change and grow with us. And we can continue to be in relation with a person even though they've died. And granted, of course, a very different kind of in relation, but still importantly like that. And maybe there are many people in the audience who know that very, very experientially and deeply because people do. And, and then it can be a part of what contributes to our continuing to learn and grow even after a very, very difficult loss. So in summary, you know, suicide bereavement is, of course, one of the most difficult ones that any of us can experience. And like any, any bereavement, it's commonly accompanied by various kinds of what we call pause points. You can call them experiences. You can call them thoughts or behaviors, whatever, that can derail adaptation to loss. And suicide bereavement does have extra ones of those. We have developed a way of approaching and treating prolonged grief disorder that's similar for um, suicide bereavement, homicide bereavement, natural death bereavement, accident bereavement. We're not seeing differences among any of those kinds of losses and is really pretty effective for people. So I think really the takeaway from this is that Grief is a common human experience, and we all have an innate capacity to adapt. And I like this, this um, quote a lot, and also the Helen Keller quote, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming it. So at that point, I will stop sharing, and thank you for your attention, and we can turn to any, any questions that people may have. Hi, Dr. Shea. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, sure. My first question is, are you okay with us sharing your slides? Sure. With yeah. our, okay. Yes. We will be doing that when, okay. in our follow-up email. The next question I have is, are you aware of a best or fastest therapy for treating survivor guilt, PTSD, or PTSD? So if we're talking about survivor guilt and PTSD in connection with the loss of 
a loved one, with the suicide loss of a loved one. I would say that probably the the this more full approach would be a good idea because um, because there may be some feeders, let's say, in from some of the other things I talked about. I mean, this is this was an hour is not enough time to really tell you everything there is to say. But aside from that, I'm not, I mean, I know a lot of treatments for PTSD that are, there are several treatments at least for PTSD that are very efficacious, prolonged exposure, CPT, um, cognitive processing therapy. Um, and I think there, there are many other people working in various ways with PTSD pretty successfully. Um, there are other people working with grief successfully also, but I don't know of a specific treatment for survivor guilt. Okay, the next question is, I have heard in other presentations that for complicated grief, you should consider yourself stuck if it was over two years and you show those prolonged grief disorder symptoms. How much variation might there be for different types of losses and individual temper temperaments? That's an interesting question. So we, we you know, I think, I, I think that in a certain way, what I'm hearing in that is that um, th this kind of worry about pathologizing grief, that's, that's what usually comes up in this context, that, if, you know, that you don't want to pathologize grief and everyone grieves in their own way and in their own time. And that is absolutely true. That's true. We, we absolutely make that assumption. But at the same time, as John Bowlby says, when, when the, the sort of defensive, the natural defensive certain ones of the natural defensive responses that we have to grief when when they get too much airtime really when they persist too long and they get too much airtime they're going to at least slow you down if not stop you cold and and grief is just going to be you know all over you you're you're not going to be able to do much of anything and that's really the point that it makes sense to get the kind of therapy that we're talking about for sure and or you know um, earlier, just getting help. I, there's no shame in getting help with grief, especially you know intense grief. I mean, it, it's just and we're not we're not trying to say that you're you know you're sick in the head or anything. Whatever pathologizing means, I'm not exactly sure myself, but we don't want to do that. We think grief is natural and adaptive, and there and everyone has the adaptive capacity. So. Why would you worry about, you know, if you feel like you would like to get some help, get help. That's how, that's, a, that's what I would suggest. Um, I am part of a Facebook group, S-O-L-O-S, -O -O for those who lost adult children to suicide. A lot of people in the group seem to have PGD. How can I help them find this help? So you can, you can, um, and actually... I realize I forgot to include our information about the, our website. Our website has a lot of information. You can also contact our, I think it's info at complicatedgrief.org, but you can, you can go on our website, www.complicatedgrief.columbia.edu. Complicatedgrief.columbia.edu, Columbi Columbia yeah. We will be including these links in your follow-up email. In terms of the memory component, how would one avoid the oversimplification over, uh, over that comes from the natural inclination towards peak and value judgments? Okay, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what peak and value judgments, what, I'm not sure what this is. Is this referring to overly positive memories? Is that what that means? What seem like overly positive memories? Do you think that's what they're talking about or something else? I am not sure. In the Q&A, the person's saying peak end and it's a memory theory. So I think that's that's the notes we just got. From. Uh, I see. So I'm, it's, a, it's maybe they could explain what that is, what the memory, what that, what peak end memory theory is. Okay, I'm why don't we table that, that and we'll come back once we get more notes. Okay. Um, where is it then we can get training for PGDT? 
again, um, our website, we, we hold uh, regular workshops and there are other ways to get training. We're, and we're just finishing up a, a fully online version that within probably another three to four months will be available online, asynchronous. You can do it yourself, it's a sort of do it yourself model. Perfect. And there, yeah. Are there programs like yours across the country? There, there are not programs like ours across the country. There are people trained. We, we have a list on our uh, website of, I think, quite a lot of people who have come to our workshops and, you know, completed our workshops. We don't, we don't have right now a certification process, but there are a lot of people doing the therapy and providing. Um, providing it in some way, whatever way they, they learn from our workshops. And we have, we have experts around, but there's no, as far as I know, there's not, there are not other centers at all like ours, sadly. It is difficult to go to survivor meetings when it starts with questions about your surviving children. This only intensifies the loss of an only child for me. How can I deal with this loss? Well, I'm, I'm very sorry for that loss. I'm sure that is intensely painful. And I can only imagine that it's very painful to, um, you know, to go to a survivor meeting like that. Maybe I, I would think that you would want to let the people know in the, in the room that it's hard for you. Maybe they could find another way to share those memories. Um, and as far as helping you directly, I, I don't think I can do that in this kind of venue. Um, but I would think that you can get help with that. Um, certainly, it's not the help you want, which is to have your child back, but um, I'm sorry. I was hoping to learn how I can help control or lessen the intensity of triggers without medication or having to find a specialist in complicated grief. Any suggestions? Well, you know, I think, I think the idea is really to be, you know, to find the reason why therapists are helpful, but it doesn't have to be a therapist. Maybe you could find a friend who could do it with you, or maybe you can do this yourself. But what, what's, what you want to do is, is try to like, um, find a way to start, first of all, make a commitment to, to do the things that are triggering. That's the first thing. Not all at once and not the most intense thing right now, but, but to do the things. And then, and then to pay attention to ways to let your emotions come. That's natural. Emotions are very natural. So don't try to fight your emotions. And from there, um, you know, figure out ways that you can manage those emotions. Often you can manage your, you, you can manage emotions pretty much always with some kind of change in your thinking and or your behavior. So I, I can't exactly tell you more than that. There's probably information, I'm sure there's information on the internet about emotion regulation and emotion management. So if you do those two things, if you make a commitment to, um, to sort of approach the things that you're triggering that are triggering for you and and to learn ways to manage emotions there's some good books out there I think you know you can you can look for them and I, I think you could do it on your own I do think you could do that all right I'm going to circle back to the memory component um, it was clear so the question originally was how would one avoid the oversimplification that comes from the natural inclination towards peak end value judgments? The clarification is that it's a memory theory. So you remember things at their best and how they ended and assess the quality of the relationship through that lens. The assessment is based on those two points, which are an absolute high and absolute low simultaneously, but the low is what you're left with. So in other words, because the, the last memory is the memory of the person's death, is that the kind of thing? Do you think that's what he's talking or she or he is I talking do. about? Okay. So, well, actually we, we do have a lot more memories than that. And there are ways to evoke memories. One of the things we do, actually one of the things we do in the, in 
in PGDT is we have a series of five memories forms, we call them, where we, we ask people to write down some of the best memories they have and some of the some of the not so great memories they have and then both memories they have in a series of you know week a week at a time and we do this after we've done three of the exercises where we ask the person to tell the story of the death so that there's some progress being made with the the it, what that does is that it it helps people um, understand really at a at a deep emotional level and a deep cognitive level, sort of behind the scenes cognitive level, the reality of the of the death, what it means. And, and that is actually helpful in in creating access to memories. So yes, I mean you can you can directly focus. You might look at pictures that that can often trigger you don't really forget all of your you don't necessarily you don't forget all the all the memories that you have people you don't really forget memories you you can have more or less access to them but you can access a wide range of memories deliberately in various ways wonderful that is it for our questions okay uh, we will be following up um with everyone who attended today with a link for this webinar, as well as the slides and the email and website mentioned in the Q&A. I also want to remind everyone, there'll be a survey. If you could keep an eye out for that, it'll help us choose our next topic. And I encourage everyone to go to the website walkinillinois.org to find your local AFSP walk. It is through these events that we're able to host presentations like this for free. And last, but definitely not least, thank you so much, Dr. Shear, for sharing your work with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining today.